Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and welcome to the Wikibon Studio. Joined with me for this segment is Brian Gracely. Uh, here in the middle of the summer, 2015, and want to really just do a rapid fire run through some of the hottest technologies in technology, maybe splash a little water on some, and understand where we are with the maturity uh, of where things are going. So, uh, Brian, let's walk up the stack a little bit. Uh, start with one that you know we've been looking at for for many years. Uh, so substrate, you know, we at Wikibon have said, you know, transforming the way that architecture is going to be built. Let's start with flash okay um, you know what, what's your take on flash what are you hearing out there uh, when it comes so to flash I, technology? I, I got to put flash in the hot technology um, we're seeing you know we're seeing uh, you know EMC is doing extremely well with extreme IO pure storage is still growing still uh, you know took a huge round of funding uh, solid fire took a huge round of funding um, the cost of it's coming down deduplications helping it uh, I think people understand it I think they trust it um, you know, has it has it taken over disk? Not yet, uh, but I think it's. I, I'm going to put it in the hot category. Yeah, and, and Brian, actually, I, I want to poke at something you said. Okay. So you talked a lot about the all flash arrays, and I think most people tend to try to think of a technology in a homogenous. It's like one bucket. Yep. When we first got in, I remember in 2011, David Floyer wrote a piece, and he said we've got kind of server-based flash, you've got all flash arrays, and then you've got what's going in the hybrid or just right. adding to those. Um, we still think there's a ton of innovation to happen in flash, even if we're now about six years into it. If this was a 10-year wave. We think there'll be more innovation in the next four years than we saw in the last six. Uh, the server-based or leveraging really high speed, what David Floyer calls Flash's memory extension, mm -hmm. is kind of the next early wave that's coming in Flash. All Flash arrays and hybrid arrays, more mature, still growing at a high growth rate, you know, probably going to see an IPO either from, you know, a pure or a solid fire sure. in, in the near future. And I, I agree, customers are ready for Flash. It's no longer kind of what, I don't get it, or why, it's where are they doing it, how does it fit. Um, what about cloud? How does Flash fit into the cloud? So, you know, what we're seeing in the cloud is we're seeing more and more all SSD offerings. So people, uh, you know, whether it's Amazon, whether it's uh, Azure, uh, offering all SSD storage for persistent storage. Um, you know, so they're basically realizing that uh, they, people want I.O., they want predictable I.O., uh, they want it in the cloud. So we're seeing that more so. The way that's deployed typically is uh, going to be you know, what you call server SAN or flash inside of the server itself. Um, but you know, we're seeing that, that trend happen just as fast. And in fact, uh, the prices on that are coming down. And I think that's helping to drive the overall pricing in the market down. Okay, uh, what about uh, any red flags or for issues with Flash that we should cover before we cover the hyperconverged service sand piece? You know, the only red flag to me right now is I think, I think some of the vendors are getting uh, a little over their ski tips talking about the all Flash data center only for the reason that if you look at how much capacity in the, you know, the, the, the fabs to build all Flash, I don't think it's there yet. So if somebody flipped a switch tomorrow, not enough capacity to do all Flash data centers, but uh, you know, it's, it sounds like it's a great title. It's a great buzzword. Yeah, and, and absolutely. So the the nuance I think we'd give from Wikibon is if if I'm doing all flash for uh, really my performance, my active data, that's where flash is going to be. I'm still going to need capacity. Uh, we actually coined a term called flape, flash plus tape, mm -hmm. because you, you're right. Uh, you know, there I'm not necessarily going to put everything that I need to archive on flash. That doesn't sure. make sense. So sure. there's still room for capacity disk. Yep. There's room for tape. Those technologies aren't dead. They just have their use cases. Their cache house for many of those companies, sure. and that's where Flash going for it. All right, let's move. You brought up, uh, if we look at uh, the, the real web companies out there and how they're leveraging storage, most of them aren't leveraging storage arrays. They have Flash uh, and other storage technologies built into the compute, uh, what we at Wikibon dubbed server SAN. Yep. Uh, so, Brian, you and I both have a lot of background in kind of the convergence, how we're trying to simplify uh, the compute network and storage of infrastructure. Where are we in, in your standpoint of converge and, uh, you know, server SAN, hyperconverge being the newer piece? Yeah, so I sort of, I break it down into two things. Number one is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different terminology, you know, converged infrastructure, server SAN, hyperconverged. To me, the, the one big trend that, that is absolutely happening is more and more customers uh, are asking to buy things packaged together. And we're seeing this you know, in virtualized environments. We're starting to see it even in containerized environments. Um, but that trend of packaging things together, whether it's converged or hyper-converged, you know, whether that's a V-block or what Nutanix does or what uh, you know, Evo Rail is beginning, all those sort of things, like that trend I think is happening because customers just go, it's easier to deploy and, and easier to deal with. Now, in terms of hyper-converged, 
Um, that's where things start, you know, we're still in that stage where people call it different things to sort of manipulate what it is. What's your take on, on that part of the market? Yeah, uh, great point. And uh, that's why we put out our vision for server SAN uh, because it's really, really early in this market. So uh, even in the last two years, we've seen some maturation. So most of the solutions today are what we would call really an appliance, which is uh, I've got my compute, it's got the storage baked into it and a software layer that helps manage all of it. Um, you've got some software only solutions, things that are like hyperconverged. So if you know you take Nutanix as the leader in, in the appliance market, you've got companies like like Maxta uh, who says take my software and make pieces of it. Uh, there's a company EMC bought called Scale.io, which looks kind of like hyperconverged, but the way it is deployed is typically you know it's it's hundreds or thousands of nodes, right. uh, not as much functionality, um, and hits very different use case. Uh, it hits more really the service providers you talk about. Um, if you talk to some service providers or even the web scale guys. You know, they don't even think of it from a storage standpoint, they just look architecturally. An example I've used often is, you know, Facebook, when they do uh, talk about an open compute uh, project, they have five configurations of server that they pick. Right. And that has the storage built into it. It's not like they say, okay, I need my storage tier, but um, if I'm database, I have this type of server. If, um, you know, a mobile app, this is kind of what I need, whether it's, you know, optimizing for performance, optimizing for latency, optimizing for capacity. Um, and and then I build those at massive scale. So we're really early in kind of this hyperconverged market, um, and we think there's plenty of room for maturity and expansion. And, and we're pretty well known for saying that within the next 10 years, we think that this you know new architecture, which is very much software-based, built for distributed architectures, is is going to you know decimate a, a lot of the traditional uh, SAN and NAS marketplace with the external storage array. Yeah, and that'll be a big thing to watch for your you know sort of traditional storage companies, your NetApps, your EMCs, HP to a certain extent, and some others, uh, and they're already beginning to see that trend happen. Any big red flags you're hearing from from end users or just architecturally about about hyperconverged or converged? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, you know traditionally when we built an environment, I have to worry about my application and how everything works. So we're still kind of knocking down application by application, understanding it. For the mid-range customer, um, you know, many of these uh, products work very well, uh, but even for mission critical, uh, the, the kind of number two startup in the space is SimpliVity. SimpliVity starts all with multi-site environments, with mission critical applications. Um, if I took, you know, a Hitachi and IBM or EMC environment and I put it in SimpliVity, um, the storage looks very similar for them. So. Um, Red flags are, uh, we're still building out the scalability, the maturity of the platforms, uh, you know, the global scale of the support on them, and really understanding how all my applications fit, not just the first couple of projects or moving them on. Um, you know, we, we don't have too many customers that have, you know, thousands of applications running on, you know, one giant pool. It's typically multiple clusters we're going to be set up. It's spreading out, um, but it's, it's very promising, even if, you know, there's some nuance that we need to work out. Right. Right. All right. So uh, I, I guess uh, you know the, the other thing I, I'd look on that is I'm starting to talk to some of the newer players in the space as to how they fit into service providers and cloud environments. At Wikibon, we really have it split out today for uh, hyperscale mm -hmm. server SAN and enterprise server SAN. How that kind of merges down the road is uh, uh, still a little bit uh, you know foggy in the in the uh, crystal ball for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So uh, I, I guess if we go from there, uh, you know the, the infrastructure. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about cloud in some of the various segments, but uh, OpenStack uh, is is really won the marketing war for what private cloud is going to look like. Uh, especially uh, if we're talking about things like we're trying to avoid lock-in. Uh, we we want to have some flexibility as to whose stack I choose from. Uh, Brian, what's, what's your take on OpenStack today? So from a from a OpenStack perspective, OpenStack started off with with big ambitions. We're gonna we're gonna take on Amazon in the public cloud, or we're gonna be the dominant private cloud. I think that strategy backfired a little bit. They really never put a dent in the in the public cloud. In the private cloud space, it really is. It's becoming VMware and OpenStack. And we've seen the consolidation or uh, you know, sort of reduction of that overall OpenStack market. We've seen either uh, companies getting acquired, Cisco's acquired a couple of them, EMC acquired a company, uh, you know, Mirantis is really sort of becoming the dominant OpenStack player as, uh, along with Red Hat as sort of their de facto what's in the operating system. So that market's played out the way we expected. We expected it to consolidate. There was a lot of players that's cons consolidating. Um, you know, to me, I think what to look for as, as you're looking out in OpenStack is, um, I think you mentioned it, it's getting boring. It, it's really, it was a lot of hype for a while. It's now getting boring. Hopefully that 
that whole community begins to focus much more on operations because that's been the, the thorn in its side is lots of features, really no focus on operations, and so it's not getting deployed as quickly. Um, but you know, they start to focus a little bit of that. Uh, IBM made a big acquisition. Uh, they've seen some talent move over to there. I think we're going to see them step up as a big third player in that space. Um, but yeah, I, my hope for OpenStack is the hype sort of mellows out a little bit, and the reality of it uh, becomes a valid competitor with, with VMware. Yeah, uh, you know, th thing I'll point out, if we talk about maturity, we're only five years into OpenStack when sure. it came from that very audacious you know, goal of what they were doing. It's like, right, were they going to try to kill off Amazon? Obviously, that didn't happen. Right. Or the early players were all saying, hey, we're going to free you from having to pay for VMware, and that hasn't that, happened that hasn't either. Happened. So the new role, uh, the article I wrote about it was uh, OpenStack's trying to help be that integration engine. So how do I adopt new technology? How do I keep my infrastructure flexible so that I can you know, work across multiple environments, not be locked into any one component? But you know, we're talking, it's compute, storage, network, uh, the whole management layer on top of that. You start adding things like you know, uh, containers and, oh wait, I want to do virtualization and bare metal. I've got like, you know, so you know, traditional projects and you've got things like Ironic. There's so many projects out there. Uh, the, the red flag I had had uh, for the last couple of years is uh, th there were two main ones. Number one is you know, we really had project sprawl. Mm -hmm. and what's part of OpenStack and how do we fit and how do we mature all those pieces. And OpenStack came out with really the big tent yep. uh, to try to help solve that. And secondly, all of the vendors that are part of this, how do I understand what's in there and what works? If you talk to the storage companies and they say, oh yeah, yeah, I fully support OpenStack. And you talk to five different vendors, some of them, oh, I'm doing testing. Some of them, I wrote the code. Uh, some of them, you know, it, it's just across the board. And so we're actually going to have, you know, well understand, you know, what gets the label from the foundation as an OpenStack solution. Uh, so the, the comment I made uh, at Vancouver this year is, um, I think I understand how the red flags can go down um, and I can really move towards that maturity. Um, the, the thing I will point out is that the maturity of the whole solution uh, still needs a little bit of work. I read a great article recently talking about how uh, you know, somebody that really lived on the operator side of the world said that the developers own OpenStack, they're not listening to the uh, operators and therefore every single company he worked with has to fork OpenStack to actually get it to work and then that's not getting back. I don't have something that is a repeatable solution which is really, we were talking in the last piece about you know, converged infrastructure and you know, hyperscale yeah. distributed architectures. I want to have a repeatable, easy to right. manage environment and that, that's not where OpenStack is yet today. Yeah, th there's really two big things that I'm sort of excited about from an OpenStack perspective looking forward. Number one is there's this new emerging trend where uh, a number of companies, so Cisco acquiring MetaCloud, IBM acquiring Blue Box, uh, we're seeing Platform 9 as a company. Basically, essentially people saying, you know what, even if it's too hard, we'll help manage it for you. And they're doing some unique things about uh, you know, essentially making it a managed private OpenStack cloud. It could be on-prem, uh, it could be in their data center. Uh, and I think we're going to see with Cisco's backing in their revenues, IBM's backing in their revenues, we're going to see that model take off more, which I think is a good thing. Get to using, get to using the infrastructure, focus on the application. And then the other big thing, and this came out in, in Vancouver, we'll see it at the OpenStack uh, Silicon Valley event, uh, more of a focus of how are containers starting to work in. You know, OpenStack was always virtual machines, containers are starting to come in, we're starting to see Mirantis do some things with people. So those are, are two very positive things in terms of people saying, how do I get from here to there, and, and how do I just make this work? So. Yeah, and the, the last thing I'll point out, uh, th there are some that have uh, kind of griped that the big players are coming and taking too much uh, involvement in the environment. So it's not just, you know, Rackspace and a bunch of startups who are now bought by all the bigger companies, right. not Rackspace, they're still standalone, but they're doing other stuff even. Right. Uh, but you've got companies like IBM and HP, and they've bought some companies that people that really understand uh, what's going on. And I think one of the things that HP and IBM are really good at is they know that they need to deploy this in thousands of customers, right. and it needs to be a repeatable solution. A uh, thing that I always gave HP really good credit for was if you deploy an environment, you know, when it shows up at your location, you know, the IP addresses are all taken care of. It's pre-configured right. because that's not what they had. That, that's no. That's what they really know how to do. There's this rack that comes in, and it's not. I'm going to spend weeks to get it up and running because right. they need to do that at massive scale. They're leader in servers, and they put a thousand people and a, you know a ton of money into doing OpenStack. Yep. So hopefully they can help with that maturity cycle so that we move a little bit more from the developers to getting the operators happy and get, getting more users there. Right. All right.
You brought up containers. So, you know, Brian, you know, I feel I've been a broken record for the last year. Everybody's like, okay, Stu, what's the hottest technology that you've seen? And, I, you know, my answer's always been, you know, other than Docker. So we are so new at Docker today. I mean, yep. we talk about the maturity. You know, 24 months ago, we weren't talking about Docker. It's like, you know, the first interview we did uh, with, with the Docker folks was, uh, I mean, it was 2014 at the beginning of the year. We right. talked to Solomon Hikes um, and, you know, the company is only about two years ago. So where are we with the maturity, uh, the reality of, of kind of the containers in general? Uh, containers have been around longer than Docker, but yep. uh, Docker is really the one that's brought it to the mainstream. So, yeah, so I, I, from, from a container perspective, a couple of big things. Um, Docker is leading the industry just in terms of, driving interest in it. You know, half a million, more than a half a million downloads in the, or half a million, 500 million downloads in the last year. So there's hyper interest. It's not just interest or buzz, it's hyper interest. Uh, the other thing, the ecosystem around it is starting to do some really interesting things. Uh, Docker announced a bunch of plugins for uh, networking technology, storage technology, um, security. Uh, so that's a good thing, right? It starts to follow the model that says it's not just one piece, but it lets the ecosystem play. Uh, and we're seeing really aggressive, interesting technology from CoreOS, HashiCorp, uh, from Docker themselves. We're seeing some of the traditional vendors, you know, EMC was doing some things with Docker and storage. Uh, we're seeing, you know, Cisco start to build some plugins around that. Um, so I, that's a very, very early days. I mean, you, for anybody who's a VMware person, it's sort of like comparing it to, to VMware 2.0 and so forth. Um, I still think the nice thing we're starting to see, and some folks will take this as a negative, but I look at it as a positive, we're starting to see actual production use cases come out where people are saying, it ain't easy, it's, it's complicated, there's problems with it, but here's what we're doing. And the nice thing about it being community centric as opposed to just vendor, if this was, if this was a feedback from a, to a specific vendor, they would try like crazy to shut that down and get that off the press. In this case, you're gonna see the community start to rally around that and go, how can I help? Where can I write code? Startups will jump in. So uh, really early days for container. It's got that weird balance between super hyper interest, uh, people are playing with it, and it's got to get mature, and there's still a lot of problems to sort of fix. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got the the new foundation that was put in place. Yep. Uh, I think it's OCI now. Yep. It was yep. originally OCP, o the right. Open Container Initiative. Right. Uh, the ecosystem, I've never seen an ecosystem build so fast. I right. mean, you know, big companies like Intel and Google and Microsoft throw in a ton of resources. I mean, Satya Nadella has been tweeting about, you yeah. know, containers and Dockers, and boy, has Microsoft been moving faster than I've ever seen them move right. uh, on a technology. Um, you brought up uh, some of the red flags there. Uh, Shopify, a company that uh, is presented at Docker, we interviewed them at the Cube at DockerCon. Uh, they were one that said, hey, we did it in production, and boy, it was tough. Yep. And boy, we're having a tough time finding peers to actually work with. So, um, But I, I agree with your analysis on this. Um, we need to see everybody rally. Um, and it's not a company. It's that, that whole initiative, um, you know, it, it, it's really nice to see even, you know, the networking was a big push at DockerCon. It's in beta, yep. and it's really just, you know, here we're setting the APIs so that all of the other companies, uh, traditional guys like Cisco, startups like Weave, uh, and, and a bunch of others can really come in and help solve that networking gap, right. um, which was one of the two big gaps. It was networking and security. Yep. Um, the GSA did some things with uh, Docker at the show along with Booz Allen, but from what I hear, I mean, security is still, that's a red flag in my mind right. and a limitation to what we're offering you can of course put docker in a virtualized environment which helps it yep. but you know what do you see as the red flags for docker um, so I don't look at it as specific to like docker I look at it as containers yeah. and I think uh, there's a couple of couple of good things so the you talk about OCI which is the the new sort of standard it's called run C which is the standard itself it combined uh, what CoreOS had proposed what docker was doing to me that says great, we have one consistent standard, I don't have to worry about that fragmenting. And that's good for a couple things. It's one for people that just want to do containers, and it's really important for people that are building platforms. So the, the PaaS types of companies, the Cloud Foundries, the OpenShifts, the Apprendas, uh, Apseras, and so forth, that's really good. Uh, the other thing I, I think it does is, once you have standardization of the container, then you can think about security. So I think, I've been very impressed with what VMware's done uh, with some of their projects, Project Bonneville, uh, some of the other ones that have come out that have sort of said, uh, what, what do you do if you want to put a container in a VM? Is there something a VM can do to help make it run fast, do security? But I think it's also going to help those platform companies say, I can now double down and focus on security. I don't have to worry about the standard fragmentation and stuff. 
All right. So, so Brian, uh, you brought up the last topic we want to cover today, which is, is the platforms. Where are we with the maturity? Uh, you know, wh where does that stand? Uh, we keep throwing away. It used to be we talked about PaaS. Now we're talking kind of cloud native and platforms. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, yeah. Where so, we? so PaaS is, PaaS is funny. It goes through these these cycles. It you know, it, it was up a few years ago. Then it was sort of down. The last few months, I mean, we've seen you know huge turnout at the Cloud Foundry Summit. Uh, DockerCon, you know, had a huge turnout, which you know is the foundation for a lot of these passes. Uh, uh, Apprenda just took a huge round of funding. Active State just got acquired by, uh, or Staccato, the assets of Active State just got acquired by HP. Um, PaaS is back to being sort of hot again, and of course we had the Cloud Native Cloud Native Computing Foundation got announced, um, and that's all about these new applications, which is what PaaS is really there for. So it's back up. Uh, I think the nice thing is it's it's back up in hype, but it's also there in terms of technology. Uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation is doing really well. They're adding more users and more customers. Um, so PaaS is on the upswing. I think the realities of PaaS are there. Uh, the red flag for PaaS, not so much a red flag, but just you know timing, um, it's a big change. Cloud native applications are a big change. Cloud native organizational models are a big change. Um, so people are going to have to be a little bit patient as to how fast that takes off. and be careful not to get wrapped up in the Docker hype versus the PaaS deployability. Yeah, uh, you know, if I, if I think back to the, the first conversation we we're having here about Flash is, well, how much of the market does that take? Yep. Well, Flash is revolutionizing the array with the all Flash arrays. It's infiltrating, you know, other parts of the stack. Uh, it, it's affecting cloud. Uh, if we look at platforms, you know, how does that fit in the overall cloud market? Uh, you know, we're uh, putting out the, the numbers from Wikibon as to how PaaS fits into the overall market, right. how it fits into infrastructure as a service. G give us yeah. a kind of a thumbnail right, on Right that. now, just from the numbers, you know, high level, Right now, we still see it as probably in that 5% range of, of that overall cloud market SaaS, IaaS, and PaaS. Uh, but we see it growing. We see it growing to probably closer to 20 or 30% over the next three, four, five years. So uh, it's going to have an uptick that's going to pull along infrastructure as well. Uh, and it's it's got so many strategic elements to it for end customers as well as vendors that it's going to be a fascinating space to watch. All right, C can you put together also op if OpenStack is going to be a predominant deployment, uh, at least you know growing in the private space, and a lot of the platform solutions like Cloud Foundry are, are going in into private environments. Do those tie together nicely? Yeah, I think we're going to see a mix. We're going to see some people that uh, again, there's rarely ever green fields. So you're going to have some need for virtual machine infrastructure, IaaS. You're going to have some desire to do things maybe at a lower cost with containers. Um, yeah, we're starting to see Cloud Foundry supports OpenStack underneath it. OpenShift obviously does. Red Hat's made a big commitment to that. Uh, IBM's made a big commitment to that. Uh, Apprenda is kind of neutral. So I think we'll see a mix. We'll see a mix of OpenStack being the underlying infrastructure, containers being the underlying infrastructure. Uh, makes it a little complicated for customers to have to think about all that. And that's why I think we're starting to see more kind of packaged solutions because the vendors want to get it out there, customers need it for their applications, but the, the infrastructure is, is complicated still. All right, so, so Brian, if I, if I run through the pieces, uh, you know, one of the areas I'm spending a bunch of time is kind of the converge and hyper-converge space and how that's fitting into the service provider and cloud environments. Yep. What's, what's hot on your plate? What's exciting you either in that list or outside of it? Big things for me right now is, is platform, sort of this, this divide between unstructured architectures and structured architectures. We just wrote a piece on that. Uh, these new evolving container, underlying container architectures. And then for me is, what's the reality of hybrid cloud? Is it real? Is it really getting deployed? Is it really more public and people are hoping they can connect them together? So those three areas are going to be you know, top of mind for me. All right, but they're all going to run our watches soon. And, Abs you know, yeah, Internet of Things, everything else that, that goes with it. All right, I think we've covered enough here. Uh, you know, a good, good rundown of, of what we have. So Brian, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for watching uh, it's, it's this rundown of hot technologies and the cold realities. Uh, check out wikibon.com for all the research. Check out siliconangle.tv for the shows and videos that we're going to be doing. And thanks so much for watching.